Hello, all you positive heads out there. It's so good to be back with all you beautiful reflections of the one source consciousness that creates and animates all things. If you're new to this podcast, of course, we are super happy to have you here. And we just ask that you bring an open mind and heart to your listening experience and to be prepared to explore vantage points that I'm convinced will help shift or solidify your current understanding of the ultimate nature of reality in a way that is extremely empowering. Speaking of exploring powerful perspectives, I'm super excited to announce the release of my very first book, The Golden Key, Modern Alchemy to Unlock Infinite Abundance. If you're ready to alchemize the circumstances in your life so that your abundance expands to an entirely new level in 2021, Head over to goldenkey.gift to download the audio or ebook as my gift to you by using the code POSITIVEHEAD. All right, all you positive heads, on this week's Soul Share episode, I'm very excited to have Eli Cohen here with me on the show. Eli is a fashion advocate and self expression facilitator who guides people on journeys to access hidden parts of themselves and expands our notions of gender uh, in order to help them find greater happiness. Super excited to have you. As I said, Eli, welcome, my friend. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, I felt like this is a very timely, you know, timely topic. So it, it's one that has just been bubbling so much in the collective and um, so yeah, haven't, haven't went down this path before fully. I mean, obviously touched on it here and there, but a, a whole episode kind of talking about express self-expression and gender identities and uh, all of these things, it, it can definitely be, um, a tricky one to navigate, I think for a lot of people too. So, um, yeah, looking forward to it. And, and before we kind of dive in here, I'd love to start with my cliche opening question. And it is this, you're in an elevator. The woman uh, next to you looks over, says, what's your passion? You got 10 floors to answer. What do you say? Uh, I say, hi, my name is Eli Cohen, and um, I'm the founder of Spacious Human. And Spacious Human is my passion. Um, at Spacious Human, we create opportunities for people to uncover beliefs and emotions uh, relating to femininity, masculinity, and gender. And when I typically tell that to people, the first uh, go round, they kind of think, well, do I really have so many hidden beliefs that need to be excavated? Uh, but usually uh, by the end of the conversation or if it's a workshop or however we're interacting, uh, people realize that there's plenty to excavate. And um, the reason I'm so, uh, I'm so passionate about uh, uncovering these hidden beliefs and emotions is I feel that they limit us. I know that they limited me for most of my life. And by um, getting in touch with our fears and learning to overcome them around the masculine and feminine codes, I found an enormous space of luxuriousness and spaciousness, freedom and joy and healing. And uh, so I want to share that with others through uh, talks, workshops, art, performances, um, social media. I'm hoping for a TEDx talk um, and, and any way I can share with people. Um, that's my passion. Wonderful. And, yeah. and I'm kind of curious to ask you a question about that question. Sure. Um, like what, what popped up for me right away was that, it, that the question was, I'm standing next to a woman in the elevator. And yeah. I was super curious about that. Mm -hmm. um, is that. Was that an important part of the question that it's a woman? Is there an attention there? You know, or... it, it, it's funny. It's, a, I mean, it's funny because I thought of it in the moment, which I really, I guess I originally used woman because you think of men getting so much, um, you know, uh, extra you know, oh, it's always got to be a man for this, that, then the other, you know, I, it's a long time ago. I think I just chose, I'm going to say woman. I, I like, I, I love, for example, to, to, when I, we talk a lot on this show, of course, about, uh, uh, the ultimate nature of reality, spirituality, consciousness, 
source, God, the universe, higher self, whatever you want to call it. And I always like to say, you know, this is how, you know, I like to refer to God as a she, um, just because once again, that's that norm of he, you know, and, um, but I, I did think right, of it right. uh, when, with you, of course, because it's, it's like, uh, you know, ob- for all the obvious reasons. So that's where it originally <laughs> came from was, you know, trying to not make everything about man. <laughs> I, I totally hear it. I hear it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I, I love that you picked up on that. So let's um, before we, we go deeper down that discussion and rabbit hole, let's uh, if you would share a little bit of your backstory, what led you here, what, you know, whatever feels relevant to share, because what I love about, you know, this conversation and, um, in, in your, who you are and what I picked up on, you know, from, from your work that led me to want to do this, um, you know, soul share is, you know, I love that you're not a 21 year old, um, who's, who's ready to talk about this because maybe it's, you know, been really trendy at your school or whatever. You're, you're someone who's really gotten, you know, come to where you are later in life, uh, you know, in your 50s. So, um, so yeah, if you would just share whatever it feels relevant to share about your backstory, uh, as we continue down this. Awesome. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm 57 years old, uh, 57 uh, years uh, young. I'm going to go ahead 57 and 57 uh, years young. Thank yeah. you. Cause I, I do feel, I do feel quite young. Thankfully yep, my body's yep. treating me well. So I'm happy about that. Um, and I'm married for 34 years now. I have three grown children and I recently became a, a grandpa, um, well, in the past three months. Um, and it wasn't until, um, I was 50 years old that I started down this um, road of exploring gender. And it wasn't something that I was aware of in uh, you know, my younger days. But what happened was um, I was in this fiction writing group and one of the participants and friend after, after I presented one of my works said, hey, Eli, uh, you ought to go to Burning Man. Mm. And so I was in a situation where I'm, I'm like a little bit embarrassed to say now what my reaction was, but my reaction was, uh, what's Burning Man? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you There's know, probably some people I, listening I, who, I mean, most that listen to this show, you know, I've been to eight burns now, I think going back to 2005. <laughs> so most have heard a lot about it, but it could be a first time listener who's like, what's Burning Man? Right. So. Right. So, so if, if you don't know what Burning Man is, you can do the same thing that I was told to do. Look it up. And sure enough, um, you know, a few months later, I said, yeah, I want to go to Burning Man, but I couldn't get a ticket. Um, But it was only a few weeks before the event. I landed on a ticket and I kicked into my super organized person that I am, you know, spreadsheets with pivot tables, organizing everything I need to get out to the desert. You know, that did not have to bring food, I have to bring everything, water, no problem. But the problem that I did have was I knew that people wear costumes at Burning Man and I was not a costume person. Mm. So I, (laughs) I uh, heard about a a costume sale that was going on at this uh, pretty famous shop, Abracadabra in, uh, in New York, Manhattan. And it was a sale just for burners. So Mm. I go there and people are just, they're ripping through the boxes that are on the floor down in the lower level. And they're like getting half undressed or I don't know, you know, yeah, and right. they're just trying everything on. And I'm standing there and say, Eli, what are you, what call, what's calling to you? And really, I had no idea. I was just a blank. So wow. I actually left, I left without buying anything. Mm. And I wow. called my friend who told me to go to Burning Man. I'm like, oh my goodness. Uh, I think I made a mistake. I can't even figure out a cause. What am I doing going to Burning Man? You know, yeah, all the doubts yeah, yeah. come in. And she says, forget about the, forget about that. You live in New York City. The garment district is right there. We're going shopping for fabrics and trim. We're just going to buy whatever, whatever you like. You mm. see th- something, don't think about a costume. Yeah. Just buy it. And then we're going to put it together. And sure mm. enough, we spent the whole day doing that. I like this and friend. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, a great friend. And we went to a friend of a friend who I didn't even know who it was with all of the stuff and started to put it together into costumes and it had this sexy wrestler and like this golden futuristic pharaoh um, <laughs> and a Tarzan kind of thing. But then she pulls out this uh, blue stretch spandex fabric mm -hmm. and she wraps it around me. And she says, hey, Eli, you know, go, go inside. There's a mirror in the other room. Wrap it around you like this and tell me what you think. And I go into that room and I wrap it around me. And then the fabric falls in such a way that there's a long slit mm -hmm. from my hip all the way down to my toes. Mm -hmm. And I look in the mirror and I say, who the hell? I don't know what I can say on this, you know, <laughs> what, the, what the language requirements are. It's a family podcast, but I said, who the heck who the heck are you over there? Yeah, I'm yeah. looking in the mirror and I could not believe myself. And then I had this, this thought immediately. I want to get the hair off of that leg. Mm. I need to remove the hair off of my legs. And actually, I thought, oh, I want to get the hair off of like almost my whole body. Mm -hmm. And so I go home and I tell my, I tell my wife that we're married for 27 years at that time. <laughs> Right. And in what I can only describe as the most epic act of love, two days before I head out to the burn, she brings me into the bathroom and she teaches me how to nair myself. Wow. And get the <laughs> hair off of my leg. Oh, wow. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. She gets mm -hmm. me started. And I'll, I'll tell some people who haven't, haven't ever nared themselves, which I'm sure there's plenty of people out there who have never tried it. That stuff can be really nasty. The yeah, smell that's what I've heard. is amazing. It's, it's, it's like burning your nostrils, but and actually even burning your skin. And it, yeah. it was at I that heard that it can that, be like it's not necessarily the healthiest thing to use. <laughs> I, I could I could imagine that that's the case because um, it smells quite toxic. Although the later versions now uh, are better, I can say. Yeah, yeah, but. Um, in any case, I realized how much work, like immediately, how much work uh, so many women do. Mm -hmm. It's it's a lot of work to get rid of that, get rid yeah. of hair. Now, yeah, I had more hair probably mm -hmm. than most, mm -hmm. but I'm not super hairy as a guy. Uh, yeah. But it's a, it takes a lot of work. Anyway, when I, when we were done, I looked down at my calf, and I can't believe that it's my calf. Yeah, I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. And I keep staring at my calf that night and on the plane all the way, two stops to Burning Man and the whole week, I just keep looking at this leg <laughs> and saying, this can't be your leg, Eli. It doesn't make, this is like, this is a woman's leg. Yeah. In my mind, yeah, that's right. what I thought it was. Right. And well, that's not, it's sort of like crack through my reality to start noticing all the little details that are involved in creating this impression around femininity, masculinity, and gender. Um, and crazy enough, it took me like four days till at Burning Man till I was willing to put that that blue dress yeah. on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the fourth Burning day Man, in, you're pretty o cracked open, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. But even there, I'm like, who cares? Yeah. Nobody cares. Actually, Nobody. it's not true. Nobody cares. They will just applaud me for it. Yeah, right, but I right. had this fear that I was still carrying. Like mm -hmm. I could wear the other things, but I couldn't wear that. And so when I got home, I realized that, you know, everybody's wearing costumes everywhere we go. They're a little more boring at home than they were back at Burning Man. And everybody is participating in this huge project like global public theater on creating these impressions around gender. And I wanted to remind myself that I am not limited to living in the man box and that it's so easy to forget because the, the public theater is so convincing. I mean, it convinced me for 50 years, so it right. really works, you right. know? <laughs> right. And I say, I need a reminder that I am free not to not to live in that box 
And so I decided I'm going to keep one reminder on my body at least every day to remind myself of that fact. Mm. Um, and so I did, you know, maybe it was a pedicure or a manicure, clear. I would start off with clear nail polish. Uh, mm -hmm. Eventually, you know, I went to maybe I'd shave my legs more often. But um, at one point, at one point in the story, uh, in this in this like two years of of exploration, I had come across a, a tank dress in a vintage shop in mm -hmm. Buffalo Exchange, mm -hmm. and I said, you know, I want to know how that feels on my body, mm -hmm. and I want to know how it feels in dance because I'm a pretty avid five rhythms dancer. It's a mm. movement meditation for people who don't know five rhythms. And I decided okay. I'm going to wear, I want to wear that tank dress to five rhythms. And um, I bought it. And the first three times I went, I couldn't, I couldn't find the courage to put it on, even yeah. though I know it's the most loving community. There's no yeah. reason to be fearful. Yeah. So I came up with this hack mm -hmm. that I'm going to, I'm going to hike it up above my shorts. And wore, I wore these. They're like they look like gym shorts, but really, really short. Mm -hmm. They're really underwear. But mm -hmm. I hiked up the tank, so it looked like I'm wearing a tank shirt. It's not a mm -hmm. tank dress mm -hmm. and short shorts before I went in, so I wouldn't mm -hmm. have to like deal with the before. And mm -hmm. then once the music starts, I'm gonna let let it drop. Wow. And so okay. I let it drop, twelve inches or fourteen inches or whatever it is to cover my shorts. And right then. I've, I've just had to shut my eyes tight. I could not, oh, like, almost like, you know, a little kid who thinks that if they shut their eyes, nobody can see them. Yeah, right, like that's, right. what, that's what it felt like. <laughs> and I had this feeling as if at any moment, people were going to start raining blows upon me. Yeah. Fist after fist. Wow. Till I get down on the floor, knees and kicking. And wow. I know in my brain that this is not true. Yeah. And I don't have any memory of ever tr wanting to do this as a kid either. So I don't know where any of this is coming, but I know I have this deep, deep fear that's been internalized and that it's paralyzing. Eventually, of course, I opened up my eyes and I was met by beautiful eyes across from me, encouraged me to dance. And of course, we dance with everybody with great joy. And I just always want to remember that fear yeah. um, that we carry, that so many boys and men carry around the feminine because it can really be paralyzing. Yeah. So you asked for a backstory. That's a long backstory. Well, yeah, yeah, so maybe no, I'll that's... give you a chance to talk. Yeah, no, that's perfect. That's perfect. Um, you know, it, it's something that I do think is becoming you know, bubbling up to the surface in culture and society so much more so um, for, for, well, multiple reasons. But I think there is more and more, you know, people incarnating on this planet who, you know, are, you know, I've heard it said, and, and this is where my, my brain always instantly goes, Eli is always thinking of things from the most, you know, spiritual kind of it's all it's all spiritual business i believe right and it's like um from from the ultimate perspective i think we're 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 it all and that's what of course people will say about anyone who's tapped in to the other side and you know sort of uh, like this book that i've been reading on the show sometimes D destiny of souls or journey of souls it's like case studies of lifetime between lives via you know um a doctor taking people through um you know, past life regression and then, okay, what happened on the other side? And it's like, we play all the roles, I believe. And it's, it, there is, it's, it's truly genderless, our, um, you know, the source, our, our soul of who and what we are. So I think you have souls. My theory is, is you have souls, it, it, you know, incarnating on the planet who are more and more in touch with, or have had more lifetimes or more experience and they're more in touch with the, the, the reality is, yeah, we all have masculine ener energy. We all have feminine energy. It's been completely out of balance and, you know, in many ways because of where we were at in our own evolution as a society. Now you're, we're evolving as a species. We're remembering the truth of the situation. 
understanding, you know, you have people like, I always think it, I, I went to Tony Robbins uh, event years ago. He's very masculine seeming, you know, guy, this big, deep voice. And, and yet he's very sensitive and talking a lot about understanding the nuances of masculine and feminine energy. And, 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 you know, that's something that he touched on a whole lot. And so I feel like it's, uh, it's something that's long overdue. And, and like I said early on, I think it's really interesting. Someone at, you know, at 50 years old, really starting to explore these things. I mean, I, instantly what comes up for me is like, wow, how w it sounds like your wife is very loving and understanding. I'm curious how it w affect, affects your children as you sort of, it, it, you know, explore some of this stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess that, that's my, my, my next question for you is how did this impact the family as you all of a sudden dad's wearing a dress, right? Um, <laughs> how did they right. Like that? So the the truth is, it's not that it's not like I wear a, a, a dress um, on any regular basis, you know? Yeah, sure. Um, it's it's something for, for for a couple of reasons, I guess. And I'll say one is I, I'm honestly not that comfortable yet in mm -hmm. a situation to say, OK, I'm just going to walk down the street on a on a given Tuesday. Yeah, um, right. Wearing a dress. Uh, I also realized that um, it's not something that I really want to do on a regular basis mm -hmm. either. When I look around me and I look at women and I pay attention now a lot more to how they dress, partly to learn, right? Mm -hmm. what, what's going on, you know? Um, really, you see that women, at least in New York, are not wearing dresses on on a regular you know on an everyday mm -hmm. basis it's you'll see a, a very small percentage mm -hmm. um so it's it's different markers of gender that really are interesting to me um and um but i guess your question was about the family right and yeah. so i feel like they have they have their own stories right yeah and i'm a little reluctant to uh talk too much about about their their story so but mm -hmm. i i will say this i feel very lucky um to have found a partner that has the courage uh to deal with the feelings that came up that were hidden for her around yeah. masculinity yeah. and femininity mm -hmm. um and um I don't want to pretend that it wasn't a challenge and sure isn't a challenge sometimes, you know, but I feel very, very lucky in that, like we've broken through and I feel like uh, it's made us closer and deepened our relationship and impacted like all kinds of areas of our lives. Um, and my kids, they're great. I don't know. They're just great. They each one has their own. Uh, angle on things i i do feel like um like there's a shift in generations that my youngest has been more exposed to this kind of thinking than the, the older i have two boys and a girl uh -huh. um but you know one of them said to me hey dad you always supported us to find out who we are and what calls to us and so this is you know like we we're gonna we're gonna pay you back you know yeah. this is what you this is what you want this is who you are and um yeah so i guess i'll leave that part yeah beautiful part beautiful beautiful yeah that's that certainly helps right uh like you said i can imagine it brings up things for everybody and by design <laughs> you know i would say by divine design and it's it's certainly makes it easier though to have at the end of the day you know to have generally have support with your family and and what's I feel interesting very about, very loved and supported very loved yeah. and supported yeah and you know I, i'm curious what what your thoughts are on the whole you know um this is such a hot topic now i know you know what someone's sort of sexes when, when they're born versus their gender identity and some of the you know you, you have a lot of people on both sides sort of talking about that so i'm curious you know what your thoughts are on 
um, on, on, you know, gender identity versus, you know, how you were born, you know. Right, sexual. right. So it's, I don't know, there's a couple of, couple of things that are coming to mind here. And I, I guess the, uh, the first thing I want to say is that I don't, I don't really think of my own exploration mm -hmm. so much in terms of, uh, of identity. Mm -hmm. I think of it more in terms of um, self-expression yep. and, and embodiment in a way. Yeah. So like what really interests me about, um, about exploring dress and appearance was like those detailed markers of gender. Mm -hmm. Like the way we interact with them on a daily basis is of like very specific. Um, it's eye makeup or, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the clothing that we're wearing, the colors that we're wearing, the fabrics that we're wearing. And those are all like very much embodied. Like we, we are, we are wrapping ourselves and adorning ourselves in certain things, fabrics yeah. or whatever it might be. And I feel like they impact, they impact us in a very wide range. They impact our emotions. They, they, I, I don't want to say so much about us. I really want to say mostly about me. Like mm -hmm. what I've noticed is when I've broken down my fears, um, I found that it changed the way I communicate. Mm -hmm. uh, it changed the way I think about success in my career. Um, it changed my uh, physical and mental health, I feel like. And it's also uh, impacted my relationship to desire, mm. which, which fe feels like less lurchy and mm. less consumptive. And I feel much more connected to my own sense of being a subject or object of beauty and desire. And so I don't feel like I need to like try and get that from somewhere else. You know, mm. I've got that within me. Mm -hmm. And um, lucky enough for me, it's like I stumbled into this situation where my erotic life was, which I always thought was was very healthy. Um, like I reached new heights of like hmm. stumbled into this thing of being multi-orgasmic, which oh. I had associated these full body orgasms a, as being uh, associated with the feminine. So it was yeah. like shut off. It right. was shut off for me. So interesting. Um, yeah. So like I think about the impact of of clothing and appearance on our bodies. And our bodies are the conduit of emotions. And so I feel that the impacts are really wide ranging. So I, I think less in terms of identity and more in terms of um, mm -hmm. the enforcement mechanism uh, that, that are yeah. dress and appearance. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds to me like you're you know, because I think back, it's funny because you, you know, Burning Man was your on-ramp. I mean, I would say the same for me to going to, you know, I went to my first burn in 2005 and um, going to, you know, thrift shops or, um, you know, places, you know, I think of like Ross or something, uh, thrift shops and going to the women's section and looking. Now, I've never went, felt drawn to wear a dress. But women's like funky pants or, you know, something like like you're describing that's like spandexy or something like uh, that's something that it, it, but it never brought up any concerns about like, oh, my gosh, this is too feminine. It's like, oh, this is funky and, and anyone can wear it, you know, is what I felt. So it sounds like your journey is almost just going a little bit further with that. Like, oh, I really want to like I want to wear the full dress. I want to and, and, and you do see a lot of that sort of thing. At the burn, I mean, especially on Tutu Tuesday, right? Where right, everyone's in right. a tutu. Like, right. um, but, you know, it, it, it obviously goes so, um, it, it, you know, I think of, it's like, it's like so many things in life. It's degrees of, you know, how, 
degrees of energy degree you know how is it super hot water is it warm is it is it cool is it cold is it it's like these different degrees and i i guess you get into the more uh it, let's say extreme end of uh identity and 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 exploring some of these things where someone says okay i was born a man and i want to identify as a woman right um and so the the thing that i you know, I find this topic really interesting because you have people on the other side of, you know, let's say it did go there, you know, for you. And it doesn't sound like you're not, you know, it doesn't sound like that's, that's your, your journey from what I'm, I'm hearing here, but that gets into really interesting territory because then you have people on the other side. It's like, okay, what if someone's taking advantage of this and they're really not wanting to identify as a woman at all. They just want to get into the woman's bathroom because, you know, they have some weird, you know, mm. um, you know, whatever they're, they're, they're not, not really, they're bad actors. Right. right. So I'm, I'm curious what, what I, I I'm, I'm hearing that that's not really, okay. really present for you, but what your thoughts are on all that as someone who's sort of, okay. You know, so in, let me delved let, into this room. Perfect. So let me say this, that, um, like early on in my journey, as I was sharing, um, sharing my journey with some friends, some of them said, Hey, Oh, you know, Eli, maybe, maybe a trans. And so mm-hmm. I said, well, let me, let me think about that, you know, and I was reading mm-hmm. up on it and, mm-hmm. um, you know, in the end of the day, I, I didn't think that that was, you know, um, you relevant to me. No, no. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm more in the, in the space of, of, creating more space around what's allowed for everyone as a human. Um, At the same time, the question that you're asking is like, I think it needs to be addressed in the sense that I think that trans folk are enormously courageous. Um, And I feel like I want to be an ally and supportive. Um, yep. and I have like only a tiny taste of the fear that people experience, um, around like stepping outside of conventions around gender, but I realize mm-hmm. how paralyzing that can be for me, like just as an exercise. Mm-hmm. And if you think about this, like it's a real paradox, I'm raised to be a boy and a man, courageous and tough. I played hockey. I got Mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, a lot of cuts and bruises and stitches and all kinds Mm -hmm. of stuff. But what scares me is a piece of fabric. Right? Right. (laughs) That's the paradox of masculinity. And the truth is, one of my one of my dance friends said to me, and, and this guy served in the military in the bomb squad. And he says to me, mm-hmm. after he sees me wearing the dress that time, says, hey, Eli, I wish I had your balls. And I'm like, think about this. If you think about it, it's like right, kind of right, funny, right, right. but it's but it's really not funny if you really think about it. Like It would have been funny if he's like, you look bomb. <laughs> right. Dead on front. Right. Okay, but got it, my dad joking. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is that rather than um, uh, like play up these fears um, around trans people for Mm -hmm. political benefit. Right. um, I just wish people would see the enormous amount of of courage. It it takes Mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, and many times uh, to walk down that path. And so, yeah. you know, I, I'm, I guess I'm getting a little exercise when I, when I hear this, it's like, um, I just wish we would, we could support people, um, in mm-hmm. their own journeys, you know, and everybody's mm-hmm. got a little bit of a different journey that they're going to take, you know, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, so I don't know if I answered the question, but uh, I'll leave that yeah, yeah, leave yeah. that there. Well, you know, not quite. But you know, I think what you're saying is is 
is very I, relevant. Well, I, I, now I'm thinking about the question. So I could say it a little bit more. I'll say that I think that there's a big part of gender that feels like an aesthetic. It's a, a big mm -hmm. part of it, right? So like mm -hmm. we all have eyes. Why, why is it that women are the ones that pre predominantly wear makeup? Is there any reason yeah. it's culturally, you know, uh, it's been different in different times and et cetera. So some sure. part of gender, I think, is an aesthetic. <clears throat> that being yeah. said, yeah. I don't know what part of it is, you know, and there's some yeah. part that people feel, um, you know, it is not just an aesthetic and innate to their bodies and who they are as beings. And um, I feel like, yeah. you know, we ought to support people yeah. like that. And I, right. I'll, I think that, you know, we should all have a, more and more freedom is what I would say. Yeah. 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 I mean, what do you say to the person who is, you know, at whatever point in their life, they're feeling similar to you. They felt, uh, you know, they felt like they've been stuck in the man box or, or woman box. Right. And they, they're interested in exploring, uh, an aesthetic, you know, the opposite of what they're raised to, to wear and, and how they were taught to be. Um, but they don't have the support, you know, I mean, I think of, I think of my own cousin who grew up in like the sticks of North Carolina, where it's very, you know, and on my dad's side of the family, which are super like man's man, you know, kind of that <laughs> that kind of uh, you know i always think of my grandfather my my dad's dad he, he if you remember the actor jack palance he was like um he's in city slickers ah uh, yes uh, yes billy crystal yeah yeah so yeah. The, the 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 old cowboy guy i mean he looks like my grandfather a room i mean that if you want to see what my grandfather was like that's like him you know and it's like now his grandson my cousin is gay and grew up in you know the middle of nowhere, North Carolina, where it's, you know, not the most forward thinking. And so I think of someone like him and what, what his experience must have been like, you know, um, someone who is, um, you know, coming out of, yeah, just it, it, they're, they're coming, they're not in the most supportive environment. You know, they want to go down a path similar to what you've gone down. What, what, what would your advice be to them? Right. Okay. So, um, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm super qualified, you know, in any expert way, but on a, like on a pers personal level, I would say um, start small. And I would say this actually to, to everybody or anybody, right? Whether they're interested or, or not feeling interested, start with something small. So it may be um, you want to just go see what those fabrics feel like in, in the women's department, mm -hmm. you know, yep. start with things that are small. Secondly, find support and there is support online everywhere. Yeah. And there yeah. are people like this person everywhere. <laughs> if you can find them, mm -hmm. so find them. It's important to find them. And um, I would say that Owning, like as I come to own who I am and develop deeper and deeper self-love and acceptance, people around me respond to that. So there's a way that um, people pick up on the self, you know, the self-criticisms that we have, mm -hmm. that those internalized judgments that we have about ourselves holy and so holy. i find that when i'm stuck it's not about like what's out in the world it's about working on myself and doing mm -hmm. that deep work to to accept myself more and more and the more i, I accept yeah. myself like to get to the stage to be here to be able to talk with you um yep you no know, that's work so yep. I would say, I would say that, you know, internal and external mm -hmm. support, find, find your people and find yourself. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's a wonderful, you know, 
thing to to touch on and and probably the most important piece of it all it's like once you start playing with the idea and having the realization that the world is reflecting you back to you in some way shape or form always and so people are going to i mean i found this time and time again you know in my own life it's like people are going to treat me the way i treat myself they're going to view me the way if i'm comfortable with who I am and what I am, they're going to be comfort- more comfortable with who I am. It doesn't mean you're not going to have that anomaly or that, you know, that one person that, but, but even those like the parent who doesn't support or whatever, but once you can frame it as they're playing the role they're meant to play in order to stimulate my growth, to give me the opportunity to, even though my voice is trembling, even though I'm scared to push through, um, you know, uh, the, the, the challenge of, of, of being, my authentic expression in the world, um, that that's actually a gift in disguise, right? right. It's like, it, you know, what I think with all these things, as we stretch into the next greatest and greatest version of ourselves, it always comes back to, you know, um, you know, if it scares you and then excites you, it's probably for you. I like to say, yeah. and it's like, it's like, um, you know, once your nervous system acclimates, then it becomes the new norm for you in a sense like once you drop the dress in the dance uh by the end of the dance your nervous system was probably in a very different state with that experience than you know absolutely. especially walking in that day Ab- right absolutely and s- absolutely so so it's expansion it's growth it's it's the butterfly becoming the butterfly it has to the butterfly in order for its wings to be strong enough to fly has to have the pressure of pushing against the chrysalis, you know, it, 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 without that, if you break it open for it, it it's doomed. It, it it doesn't have the strength because it didn't work out its wings prior in order to, to be able to, to actually fly. Right. And right. so I think that's a very important thing for us all to understand as we, you know, um, expand. Right. And so, um, you know, if doing that self-work, looking at yourself, working on yourself, um, you know, really adopting the perspective of there is no out there, out there. They're going to show up as a reflection. They're going to see me the way I see myself. And if someone is particularly challenging, uh, instead of viewing that as a reason to shut down and shrink, I'm going to, I'm going to use, look at that as my invitation to expand and love myself despite their, you know, their opinion. It's, it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's like kind of a divine dichotomy, like two different, you know, both are true. It's like, from one perspective, there is no out there out there and it's reflecting you back to you. From another, it's like it's none of your business, their, their, their thoughts about you. I think both are true in different ways and different vantage points. And it's like they're living out their own. You're, you're offering them the opportunity to confront their own limitations and you know, realize that you know, someone's judgment of you is directly proportional to their le- their level of ignorance, I would say. And mm-hmm. so I think once you can really take all of this and wrap it up in a, I don't know if it'll ever be a neat little bow, but you know, <laughs> you can just really embody a lot of these perspectives as you step into your more authentic self and, and your butterfly self, um, you know, they're going to serve you very well. And, and And that's always the thing that I think is the most we can have a lot of theories and ideas about this stuff, but when you apply these particular perspectives that I'm just sharing here, it's like, they're going to work. They work, you know, and, and try it and see for yourself is what I would say. Right. Right. And it's, and I agree that it's a, a practice and it's a practice that I'm in. Um, yep. And um, I also, I do want to say though, that there is an external reality that people, um, you know, we should acknowledge. And that for uh, trans women, especially, there's like an enormous amount of danger out there. And so, yeah, yeah, um, you know, that needs to be taken into account in in how you, uh, how you live your life, too. So, you know, yeah, yeah, it's a dance. It's definitely a dance between I'm creating my reality. There is, you know. And there's these things that may be attracted into that reality that are growth edges. It doesn't mean I want to put myself in harm's way and be a fool, 
either right. like, oh, now I'm just going to, you know, it's that it's kind of that it's kind of like, uh, do I lock my door at night or do I not? Oh, am I am I calling it in because I'm giving energy to the idea that there's something to fear? It's like, well, both perspectives are valid to lock your door or not lock your door. Where are you at with the process? And whatever's the most comfortable and serving for you is what I would say to do, you know? And so it, it is such a nuanced dance between all of these things. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's what it means to be human is figuring it out. What's my formula and my path? And, and you know, um, what story am I telling that is, you know, um, and, and I believe at the end of the day, that's the thing that's going to show up the most, the, the reflection of the story that you're telling. And, and right. it's okay if you're maybe fearful or don't have the courage or maybe it's not the right time and space to go into, you know, the, 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 the super men's rally dressed in a dress or whatever in, in the middle of Mississippi, <laughs> you know? Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it, it's definitely very nuanced, right? Right. Right. That's true. And I, and I, I, I do think though, that, um, like a lot of, a lot of my work is centered around people who are not really thinking about gender on a regular basis, right? Um, a lot of my work is sure. is uh, creating opportunities for people to notice um, their what they put out of bounds for themselves, what things they don't consider even, um, mm -hmm. and to take a small step in experimentation um, and see yeah. what it feels like and see do fears arise because I, 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 I tried on these sneakers that have like pink on them or, um, right, right, right. you know, what comes up and there's, you know, people are surprised by the strong feelings they might have. And I know, mm -hmm. I know like you, you, you were talking about a cousin who, you know, who may have been exploring or, uh, I don't know exactly what they, uh, they were not in the, he came out, uh, eventually came out as, is is gay. Okay. You know. Um, but you know, I'm not really talking so much about sexuality either. Sure. Um, sure. But oftentimes, of course, these things go hand in hand, right? Yeah. Yeah. And there are a lot of assumptions that people can make about me too. Um, yeah, sure. But um, you know, I'm thinking back to my my childhood, right? Back back in the '70s, there was this movie, The Bad News Bears. I don't know if you know the movie. Oh yeah. Okay, know, it's about like a really bad little league team, baseball team, baseball yeah, team, yeah. right? And there's a pitcher. The pitcher on the team is amazing. She she's the only girl in the league. And of course, she ends mm -hmm. up on the Bad News Bears, right? Um, she's yeah. not, but, but she's amazing, right? Now, like 20-something years later, I'm living in the suburbs of New Jersey. And I have my own son who's going to be playing t-ball, you know? He's like that mm -hmm. age. He's getting ready for, for baseball. And by that time, the world had been transformed because you can... You could, you know, drive around on a weekend out there and half the fields were girls playing t-ball and baseball and softball. The world had changed completely. And there were dads out there who loved baseball, mm -hmm. loved the sportsmanship, the competition, the pushing themselves. And they were teaching their daughters how to play ball. And some of them liked it. And some didn't, but everybody really in that environment had that opportunity. Yeah. But today, like today, I let's say I go for a pedicure or a manicure, and I mm -hmm. see that the moms are bringing their daughters in. They're not bringing their boys. Boys haven't mm -hmm. had that opportunity. Mm -hmm. So like, like mm -hmm. this was not something that I felt like I missed out on as a kid at the time. I wasn't pining for it. I never did my nails. And it wasn't yeah. something that I that I wanted, but if I would have had that opportunity, I would have maybe I would have liked it, and I know I like it now. And so the question is: Is that like an important 
aspect of life to be transmitting to another generation. And mm -hmm. if you believe, as I do, that femininity should not be at a lower rung in the hierarchy, mm -hmm. you know, below masculinity, mm -hmm. then there's a value sure. in this that boys are not learning. And yeah. they should have an opportunity and they could like it. They don't like it. It's like the baseball thing. Some people will like it. Some mm -hmm. people will, will not like it. And it's just like girls. There are plenty of girls that don't like the whole nail polish thing either. Um, yeah. But we all have nails. And so why is yeah. the distribution of who gets their nails done so skewed? Right. Why? Because right. it's, it's a practice. It's something that we, we are taught. There's a wisdom in both the feminine and masculine. And somehow we're not passing it down, both of them, to everybody. And we're limiting ourselves yeah. as humans in that mm -hmm. aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. And I think... Um... Luckily, we are seeing that shift. Um, you know, I think the, you know, Gen Z kind of, you know, those coming up now, it's like definitely, you know, I think of my own son. He, he did go to an art school, <laughs> so it was probably not the normal, you know, uh, but very, you know, wide open. You know, everyone is comfortable expressing any and everything. Not a problem. You know, if anything, there's more of that than not, you know, uh, people kind of you know, doing any and everything they, they want creatively and, and, and a radical acceptance of that. So that is starting to happen. Uh, like I said, that's probably, you know, a, a school of the arts is probably, you know, on the cutting edge of that, I would right, say in California, right. but, um, <laughs> but, um, yeah. So I think, uh, I think, would you agree that things seem to be shifting in a good way? Yes, I do. And I, um, I, I definitely feel like, uh, Gen Z is in a completely different space, even from, a, you know, a generation uh, older sure. than them. And certainly, um, you know, my generation, um, completely, yeah. completely different. But I think it, it's also it's also true to say that, you know, what's happening in an art school in California, you know, mm -hmm. is not happening everywhere, you know. And so. Yeah. Um, like I'm super encouraged and I'm inspired by what young people uh, are doing and how they're impacting the, the world. Um, and yeah, and, and it makes me very hopeful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Likewise, likewise. Well, yeah, this is, this has been such a fascinating uh, conversation. And as we kind of wind down here, um, I would like to shift gears just a little bit. Okay. Uh, I love on the show, listeners love to hear stories of synchronicity, serendipity, positive mm -hmm. paranormal stories, kind of our go-to here. And uh, so I'm curious if you have any sort of inspired story uh, along those lines that you'd care to share. Oh, amazing. Yeah, so one of the uh, art projects that I'm working on is called A Body Hair Experiment, and we hope to turn into a book. But what the experiment mm. is, is um, I removed the hair off of the left side of my body and kept oh, my wow. right side hairy. And then, uh -huh. um, right. and the idea was to draw attention, like I said, to the fact that like these both are my legs, right? So uh, then I commissioned the photographer and the photographer is the same person that did my headshot, you know, mm -hmm. and I spoke to them about it. Um, and I said, would you feel comfortable? You know, it's a very intimate photo shoot. Would you feel comfortable doing this photo shoot? Oh yeah, sure. I've done some art projects Sure, I can do that. Mm -hmm. So after the, after the, the, this whole photo shoot on the body hair experiment takes place, I find out that the photographer uh, by the name of O Zhang is a super accomplished photographer that's had over a hundred um, uh, exhibitions worldwide, including the Guggenheim and the Miro. And like, wow. here I am, I know nothing about this. I know nothing about her. Um, and it almost feels like a miracle 
because the photos are just just so amazing. I just I, I still can't even believe that we came together around this. So wow. Yeah. Cool. So you, you you ended up with someone well beyond what you thought was right. possible. <laughs> right. Which right. I think is a which I think is a great indicator of someone being on their path, you know. It's like they say a lot of times synchronicity, you know, is showing that you're on the on the right path, you know, of your highest potential and timeline. And so um, I think that's a that's a nice, nice indicator there. So that's the way it feels. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, for those who are interested in connecting with you, continuing to follow your work, what what would be the best best way for them to do this? Uh, So you can uh, go into the website, spacioushuman.com. Uh, sign up for our emails. You can follow me at Spacious Human on Instagram. Um, we've got a survey out there on, on the website, on the homepage. Uh, it's a quick survey that you can take uh, to answer simple questions about your comfort level in different kinds of dress. Uh, it's kind of fun and take two minutes if you're interested there. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping to be out on stages. Um, hoping to get on to a TED talk, but follow us, follow us there. And you'll find out about the upcoming events, workshops, um, planning a retreat out in the uh, fall. So great, you know, sign up. And there's also an opportunity for one-on-one coaching too. So find us on the website. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, I do have one final question for you here and it is this. In 60 seconds or less, what is the meaning of life, according to Eli Cohen? Uh, the meaning of life is, is uh, joy and freedom. Um, dance whenever you can, because mm. uh, if, you, if you're lucky enough to be in a position to dance and find partners to dance with, you're connecting to people, you're finding more freedom. Um, living the joy of life and um yeah that's that's what i would say it's it's about connecting and and connecting joyfully so to me it feels like dance dance is the answer yeah 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 i um i think of um a quote about dancing like everyone is watching that i actually uh reference in my book so i don't know if you've ever heard that quote i don't have it memorized but dance um, like nobody is watching or like everybody's watching. dance like everybody is watching ah interesting here i pulled it up real quick it says they say to dance like nobody is watching i think that implies that we are afraid or ashamed to dance in front of the people i say dance like everybody is watching dance like your children are watching your ancestors your family dance for those who are hurting those who can't dance, those who lost loved ones, and those who suffer injustices throughout the world. Let every step be a prayer for humanity. Most of all, dance for the creator who breathed into your soul so you may celebrate this gift of life. Beautiful, beautiful. Isn't oh, that, that, isn't that is beautiful? amazing. I think, that is I think absolutely that's, that gorgeous. Is super, Superman is the, <laughs> is the person that says it, the artist, S-U-P-A-M-A-N. And uh, yeah, I think that is a perfect way to end this this episode to sum up everything that you're talking about and doing in your own life and expression. I, I am so grateful for you uh, having the courage to to you know do what you're doing and to step out and talk about it in this way. And uh, all of you out there listening, keep on keeping on, keep on stretching those butterfly wings. Until next time, journey well. Love you so so much. Also, before we sign off, I wanted to remind you to download the Golden Key audio or ebook as my free gift to you at goldenkey.gift using the Golden Key code positive head. And please, if you enjoy my gift, leave a positive review on Amazon so others can find the book and unlock their lives with the help of the Golden Key as well.